Good morning, everybody. We're going to start today with prayers and concerns, or prayers of the people. Um, does anybody have any prayers or concerns they would like to share? I had asked for prayers on the prayer chain for my sister-in-law. She had a partial hip replacement yesterday, and my brother said she's well enough to complain and joke today. So things are looking up. Lord, hear our prayers. Yevi? I'm just asking for continued prayers for Darren, my, my son's best friend. He's with cancer. He's not doing great. Thank you. Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you. We'd like prayers for our youngest daughter, Katie, uh, who is uh, very ill out in California with a variety of pneumonia, breathing, that kind of problems. Lord, hear our prayers. Okay, mine is a celebration, two of them actually. One is Dear Sweet Max is in a, a very funny play at the Village Players. Um, he just did the first weekend and he's he's up again next week and it was it was a real treat. He's amazing. And the second is that our our dear buddy Sam is here with us today after a successful freshman year and a successful time at teaching being on the staff at Upward Bound and he's beginning his uh, sophomore year and taking on the duty of being a residence assistant and being responsible for a uh, a floor in a dorm full of students. So no, no, no pressure, Sam. <laughs> Praise God. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Okay. Um, now, if you'd like to join me in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you <laughs> for people who are old timers here and some timers here and new, brand new here. Welcome, welcome. I'm really honored to uh, introduce our sermon giver this morning, Patty Schmook. Patty and I became friends in a conversation about our mutual interests in caregiving and in grief work and she continues to do grief work here for our community and it is an inspiring experience and she's inspiring i think if i and she's also a life coach and i think if i had had patty's advice earlier on i might have found my passion in advocacy maybe decades ago <laughs> but time is what it is and i'm grateful for the friendship and for the knowledge so I'm not reading anything, I, even though I wrote it down. I want you to know that there's a uniqueness in the message. Patty was here a while ago, if you remember, with Pastor Terry, and they had this wonderful sermon-like conversation about thought and how you, you own your thoughts and sometimes they own you, and you have the opportunity to change how you think. So I uh, don't think that's exactly what we're going to hear about today, but whatever we hear today, a call to love is going to be something that you have the opportunity to be inspired by. So I will now turn this over to Patty and ask you to just open your ears and open your hearts and see what happens. All right. 
Good morning. I may get to the point where this microphone gets set down and I just start screaming because I'm a mover and a shaker. So, all that being said, I just want to talk a little bit about, you may or may not get to the, the meat of the subject. I think I'm going to touch on all of it without actually going each piece by piece by piece because it's all kind of together. It's all the same message. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what brought me here today. What brought me here today was a message from Miss Ginny. Hey, would you like to do the pulpit supply? Sure. I'd happy to help out. Somebody said it. Thank you. And then I get an email from Andrea. Here's the brochure, the, the, not the brochure, the program, the bulletin. Just go ahead and design it any way you want. Here's some examples. I'm like, ah, what? Um, you know, I, I'm not a church going person normally. I went to Sunday school as a kid, got a little bit of um, religious background. I'm more of what you call spiritual, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. So I thought, I don't know anything about all this traditional stuff. Oh, no. So I wrote her back and I said, what exactly is the expectation here? And she said, well, just kind of do what you do. And here's another example from 4th of July. And it's a little simpler. And maybe you could go with that. OK. Well, I took the message that I knew I wanted to talk about, and I put it into the bullet you see today. Almost. Then I get another message from Miss Ginny. And what I'm going to describe to you right now is kind of what we're going to talk about. And in her message, she said, hey, can we talk about your bulletin? But she did something that really kind of threw me into my own brain. This is not against you, Jenny. This is all about me. She put question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point after her question. And I immediately went into my brain and created some stories about how they didn't like what I said. They didn't want me here. They were going to be sorry they had me. Oh my gosh, I wanted a whole story. I don't know if I want to have this conversation. But then I realized, Patty, you're making this up. This is not what's happening. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what they're going to say. Just see how it goes. This is my favorite mantra. When I get into my head, I'm like, let's just see how it goes. So my reply was, sure, I'll be there on Saturday after grief group. Let's talk about it. So Jenny and Joe and I sat down and we had a lovely conversation. And basically all they wanted to do was figure out how to put in the traditional bits that need to happen. That's it. Everything else was fine. My story was not necessary. So look, at here's when I was a kid, like I said, I don't have a religious background, but I did go to Sunday school. And one of the things I can remember them saying is God made men, man, woman in his own image. So to me, that meant humanoid, much like the Greeks and the Roman made their, their gods humanoid. Yeah. So I thought it was all about how we look. I thought this was about a mystical man in the sky who got to decide and to judge who is good and who is bad and what is right and what is wrong. After my son died, I had no use for that concept anymore. None. That guy, I got no use for him. But then I heard something from a man named Michael Beckwith, and he said, God is a presence that's never an absence. Different concept. Okay. I can kind of get behind that. And another thing that, so that's kind of where my journey's gone. Another thing that I heard in Sunday school was, you know, the God in the, in the, in the, in the image and the humanoid. What's happened with me now is I've come to another seeing a deeper understanding. Yes, God made us God, universe, source, Whatever word you use, spirit, doesn't matter. It's all the same feeling. God made us in his image because we are creators. He created, we create. Look around this room. Everything you see was created by a human. And it started with a thought. And our thoughts create everything. Our thoughts create our entire experience of life. There's no experience you have that comes from the outside in. It all comes from the inside out. Case in point, 
Ginny's exclamation points and question marks. She didn't mean anything by it, but boy, did I make meaning of it. I created a whole story. No, 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 no. That's, that's not a you should, shouldn't. No, no, no. That's just I'm pointing to what we do. This is what we do. We create. And it's important to understand that because the other thing that brings me here today was the day that Reverend Terry and I talked, the theme of the day was love thy neighbor. So what I want to do is I want to give another perspective on love thy neighbor, which is understand the spiritual truths for what's true for all humans. We're alive. We have the capacity to be aware and we think. These are the three principles uncovered by a man named Sidney Banks back in the 70s when he had an enlightenment experience. It lasted about four seconds. But in that moment, he recognized the underpinnings of human psychology. And it's the underpinnings that we've kind of moved away from in psychology. If you look at the word psychology and you break it down into its parts, you get psyche logical. Psyche is the soul and the mind, the study of the soul and the mind. But we can't quantify the soul and the mind. We can't measure it. So psychology has gone into behavior, and they look at behavior. But what is the origin of behavior? It's thought. My behavior created by my story about Ginny's exclamation points do you see what I mean? And this is how we all work. How many people in this room think that what they think is right and true? Yeah, look around the room. You're going to see almost every hand up. Because that's how we work. We hear it in our head. We think it's true. But it's not. It's just what we're thinking in the moment. How many people in this room have had an experience where you've observed your thinking? You've had a thought come into your head, and then you went, whoa, where did that thought come from? Or you can just sit back and just kind of observe the thoughts going through your head without really grabbing onto them. Anybody have that experience? Yeah, I'm seeing hands and nods. Absolutely. This is how we work, folks. This is how we work. And when I get down into the bulletin, a call to love. Everything we do is either love or a call to love. This is from a book called A Course in Miracles. I have not read this book myself, but one of my teachers quotes this quite often. And what she means by that is that we are either in a feeling of love or we're being called back to love. And even that call back to love is love. So here's an example. Because we think, and because we have the capacity to be aware of our thinking, every emotion that we feel in our body is being created by what we think in the moment. And when we feel so-called negative feelings, jealousy, anger, hate, rage, those are all a call back to love. All our emotions are telling us is the state of mind that we're in and the quality of our thinking in the moment. When I got that at a deeper level, I can, not always and not immediately, look at people who are angry and realize they're not angry at me. They're not even angry at the world. They're just having thinking right now that's causing them pain. And I can feel compassion for them for that reason. Because you know what? Me too. Me too. That guy on the road can cut me off and I can start swearing and yelling. And didn't he see me there? And other times I can get cut off and think, oh, geez, I hope they don't have an emergency. Same situation. I got cut off different reactions. Why? Different states of mind, different thinking. Does 
So the next thing I'm going to say is don't listen to my words, listen for a feeling. I was really torn on which one to go first because they kind of go together. <laughs> but you can't do them at the same time. So Sydney Banks used to always tell people when he'd speak to them, I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to speak to you, but I'm going to ask you not to listen to my words. And people will say, well, why are we listening to you? Because what you're listening for is a feeling. I could go around this room right now and I can ask each one of you what God means to you, and each one of you are going to come up with a, a different concept. I read the bulletin letter that Carol Jeffrey sends out every month in June, and there was a lovely letter from Miss Tisha to Reverend Terry. And in there, in that lovely letter, there was a few words that caught my mind, caught my eye. And she said, we say God, you say spirit. And I thought, what a beautiful way to highlight that the words don't matter. It matters what you feel. What does your faith feel like? And it doesn't matter the words. And if you can get past the words, you can find love and compassion for people that have no religious beliefs that you have or different religious beliefs that you have because it doesn't matter. It's all the same feeling. It's the feeling that matters, not the words. We get very hung up on words because our intellect gets off on words. Ooh, loves the words, loves to figure them out. That's not where our spirit lies. So then we get down to, we are all the same electricity lighting up different bulbs. That quote came from a show called The Kaminsky Method, starring Michael Douglas. He's an acting coach, and he's up there talking to his people, and he said, look, we're all the same energy lighting up different bulbs. In my world, we have a different metaphor. That metaphor is ocean. We are all made of ocean. We're just different waves. We are all the same at our core. We are all alive, we are all aware, and we all think we are exactly the same at our core. We look different, we have different hairstyles and different skin colors and different eye colors, and we have different religions and different backgrounds. Those are the waves, but they're not what we are underneath. Paying attention to what we are underneath is where we find connection and love and compassion. But seeing it within yourself first matters. And boy, have I learned this firsthand. When I first started learning the principles and I started teaching them to people, I was doing it at an intellectual level. I'm just giving you information because this is how we are conditioned to take information and apply it. Take information and apply it. Learn your times tables and take the, tape, the test, right? Nothing wrong with that. But we get into that groove and we start to look into our computer for answers that don't exist. And when I say computer, I just skipped over. Our intellect is like a computer with no internet connection. The only thing that's in your intellect is what you've put it there. Nothing exists in your intellect that you haven't already experienced. I see this in my grief group. People will say, people don't understand what I'm going through. Of course they don't. They haven't had the experience. They don't have that experience filed away in their intellect. But boy, when the women in my group say, now that I've been there, I get it. I am so much more compassionate towards someone who lost somebody. Because they have that information now. And now they're what I call your inner wisdom. You can call it intuition. You can call it inner guidance. You can call it God. You can call it whatever you want to. That which runs us uses our intellect as a tool to help us find answers. We're afraid of the unknown. We don't like the unknown. Unknown bad. Which is why we go up into our minds and we create stories. 
And we all do it. And we all experience those stories in our bodies as emotions. Our emotions are always guiding us toward the quality of thinking we're having. When I tell somebody, someone says, I have panic attacks, and I say, that is awesome. They're like, what? Why would I, I, a panic attack be awesome? Because a panic attack is an invitation back to love. A panic attack is just simply telling you that you're overusing your thinking. That's it. That's all it is. People get very wound up about the words. I have anxiety. I have depression. What they don't see is underneath it's all thought. Meaning, the feelings that you're feeling in your body are being created by the thoughts that you have in the moment. And it's true for everyone. Now, some of you will hear me say this and you will dismiss it. And I get it. Some of it, it will, so for some of you, it will resonate. And for others of you, you're going to go away in three days. You're going to hear something and the penny's going to drop and you're going to go, oh, that's what that means. That's an insight. Insight, revelation, realization. You read about it in the Bible all the time. Right? This is how we learn. We learn through insight, realization, and whatever words I just said. Remember, I've been up, I, I, got, I went to bed at 3 o'clock this morning. So we're looking for that insight, and we don't find insight up in our heads. When we get very wound up, we don't know we need to find an answer. We get very tense in our body. We're, it's, it's an indication that we're in our intellect trying to find an answer. When we settle down and we let God, wisdom, intuition come in, answers come to us, seemingly from out of the blue. Even information we have stored in our computer that we can't find when we want it. How many people have said, oh God, what's that actor's name? Jeez, I can't remember that actor's name. And then at 2 o'clock in the morning, you wake up and you go, oh, Sean Connery. It's because you stop thinking about it. And we all know this, right? We all know. Stop thinking about it. It'll come to you. What we don't recognize is the mechanism that makes it work. Like, that's how it always works. When we drop out of our thinking, I equate a thinking to shaking a snow globe. If I'm up in my head and I'm trying to find an answer that doesn't exist and I'm getting anxious and I'm getting upset and I'm getting angry and I'm getting frustrated, I am shaking that snow globe like crazy. How do you settle a snow globe? You put it down and it settles. And people say, well, how do I settle my mind? I can't stop my mind. It just keeps going. Well, you're trying to stop your mind from thinking by doing more thinking. You're shaking that snow globe. You got to settle. You got to relax. And this is natural for all of us. We've all had moments like this where we've dropped out of our thinking and we've become calm and we come back to love. Not personal love, not affectionate love, the feeling of peace and calm. Now, folks, I am using words right now to try to describe something that has no form. God has no form. He is formless. But all I have to point at it has form. So no matter what word I use, it's not the thing I'm pointing at. The only way it can be realized is from within. You can only realize it from within. This is a book that Sidney Banks wrote called The Enlightened Gardener Revisited. And in it, there's a quote, there's three quotes I want to read. One is, true wisdom is not discovered, but uncovered. From an uncon uncontaminated, innate intelligence. And what he means by uncontaminated is when we get in our head and start thinking, we're contaminating that feeling. We're kind of ruining it, if you will. <laughs> wisdom lies beyond our delusionary ego and personal thought system. Believe me, words do not convey the magnificence of the hidden treasures that lie within. 
We come to church for a feeling. We don't come for the words. If you come for the words, you're missing out. Here's another quote. Have some faith in yourselves and know that somewhere deep inside, beyond your ego, which is just all the thoughts you think about yourself, beyond the personal self lies a beautiful flower waiting to unfold. It is the light of true knowledge that will make it blossom. It's seeing spiritual truth. When I talk to people about spiritual, I kind of get the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not practical. There is nothing that could be more practical than this. To understand that your thoughts are creating your feelings from within, no matter what's happening outside of you. To know that you can always think again. To know that thought, the energy of thought runs through you because you're alive. It runs through you 24-7 from the day you're born to the day you die. We are thinkers. We create with our thinking. That is powerful. People say, yeah, yeah, it's just my thoughts. And that's like saying, yeah, 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 it's just nuclear energy. Everybody has within them mental health, mental well-being but it gets covered up by all our thinking. In the self-help world, you'll hear something called limiting beliefs. We have limiting beliefs. Well, a belief is just a thought. Think of a lamp that's on, but it's covered up by a bunch of veils. Seems kind of dark. Imagine those veils are your thinking. Start peeling away the veils and what happens? The light seems to get brighter. Well, the light was always bright. It's just it was covered up by your thinking. And when you see that for yourself, it changes your life. You're still going to get caught up in your thinking, but it's going to last much less. It's going to be much shorter. I've had people say, very recently, someone said to me, you know, I used to get stuck in my thoughts for weeks. Now it's minutes or hours. That's a beautiful thing. This is the potential that we have by recognizing what's spiritually true for all of us. Because when we recognize it in ourselves, we recognize it in others. And that is a completely different take on love thy neighbor, folks. Our thoughts are the psychological threads that weave our entire experience here on earth. Weave your thoughts with love and respect for your fellow man, and you will weave a blanket of love and understanding for everyone. So on the bulletin, I wrote, this is an exploration. The reason I say exploration is because I love to hear from other people. Because I know that right now, if we had a speaker on each one of your brains, there'd be a lot of noise in this room right now. Y'all are thinking. You're either thinking, I'm crazy, or you're thinking, yeah, I get it. Or you're thinking, okay, I don't get it. Or something else. So what I would love to do is I would love to see if anybody would like to share what's happening for them. Have you heard anything? Is there something you have a question about? Is there something that resonates with you? And I encourage you to speak because when you're in a group, and I find this in my grief group, and I do a group, a group on Wednesday evenings too on Zoom, I find that when people speak, other people hear something that resonates with them. What I'm saying may not resonate for you, but someone else might. So, anybody have anything they'd like to share? First of all, I have to say, the last time I was here, Dave was the first one to have something to say, and it still brings tears to my eyes what he said. So just go in there.
Is it working? Okay, I'm sorry. Technically disabled. <laughs> uh, I was just sitting here listening to you talk, Patty, and uh, one of the strains that ran through my mind uh, were very happy strains. Um, Jenny and I were two of the volunteers in the great music camp we had here at church all week long. And uh, there must have been about 30 kids, and we had a whole raft of volunteers. And uh, it was uh, an amazing, enlightening feeling I got out of spending the week. Uh, our, our assignment was play games with them. <laughs> and we, we played games with all three age groups and all kinds of different feelings and sitting under a Max's parachute with the fans blowing up in the air and all the people, people screaming inside and really enjoying and expressing of themselves all over the place. But it, it was a collection and a plethora of wonderful feelings for me, uh, of satisfaction for myself, being around all these people, and for the, the kids and what they were getting out of the week, not just the music, but uh, the spirit in this place and the people around them. That's my thoughts. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It must have been gorgeous. Very connected, very in the moment. And that's the key, being in the moment, right? Because our minds are time travelers. Did you know that? Our minds time travel. They go backward and they go forward. But they really rarely are in the moment. But it's when we're in the moment that we have experiences like that. That's gorgeous. was also this week during music camp. We had planned exactly what we wanted to do during music camp. And by Tuesday, things weren't happening the way they were exactly planned. <laughs> well, no, I'm gonna put it this way. They were going as planned, but they didn't work. So I didn't know what I was feeling. I was, I don't know, angry and all sorts of things in my head. Now I know what, you, what happened to me because you just said it. So I went home and I was feeling awful. And with a lot of stuff happening in my brain, and finally I said, you know what? I have to just stop, stop thinking. And I prayed and I, I just got myself in a peaceful state and I knew exactly what we needed to do. And it was not what we were doing. It was the opposite. And it was such a wonderful feeling. And I think it, everyone was feeling that way. Maybe other people had the same experience that day. I don't know. But I got, when you talked about it, I said, that's what happened to me. <laughs> it's always great to know what happened. And, and, but the thing is, this happens to us all the time. I, someone at the bar that I worked at said, hey, you want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> right? Because we do, we get into our heads and we think it's going to go like this. And again, we have time traveling brains. This is how it's going to go. Well, life doesn't work that way. Because the things we don't take into consider are other people, other people's thoughts, other people's states of mind, other, where other people are at, and what other people need in the moment. But I love that you said you let yourself settle, and then you knew what to do. Yes, that's it. That is it. I wish I knew this stuff when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. That's okay. We're learning it now. Norma? Um, yes. Um, as a lot of people know here, I have an up and down relationship with uh, my oldest daughter, um, where we had a seven year estrangement. Uh, I have since been reunited. Well, everything was going up, and all of a sudden we had a snag. 
it put me in such a funk that I couldn't think straight. Fear. And I couldn't, couldn't get rid of it. And I finally had to let it go and let my heart fill with love. And once I did that, the funk was gone. So just an example of changing your thinking a little bit. And, and what I would offer is you didn't actually change your thinking. You just let it go. Yeah. Because here's a conundrum. We get told, you can change your thinking. Well, you know what? Once thought is in form, you can't change it. It's out there. All you can do is think again or just relax and go into a state of no thought. People talk about meditation. Meditation is great. You should meditate. And maybe you should. I don't know. But people get very hung up on the doing of meditation. Am I doing it right? I'm thinking while I'm meditating. I don't think I'm supposed to think while I'm meditating. Am I doing this right? Oh my gosh, it's been, how long has it been? Five minutes? Okay, now what's, oh God, I, my butt hurts. Doing meditation is not meditation. Meditation is exactly what Norma just described. Meditation is being in the flow. How many of you have been in the flow? You've done art or you're writing and you're in the flow. That's a state of meditation. You can be in a state of meditation doing your dishes. I did it this morning. It's whatever you takes you out of your personal thinking and just settles you. We are built to be in a state, to live in a state of meditation. We are built to be guided because in that place of meditation, in that place of quiet, you know what to do, you're guided. And you can call that God, you can call that intuition, you can call that, I call it wisdom, it doesn't matter. The feeling is what matters, right? I love that. Anybody else? Don't be shy. I start calling on people. Yes, Jenny. Can you take your, I have a story to tell, but it's, it's my feelings that I was able to share with somebody else, getting out of my own head, but feeling the need and the pain of somebody else that I could change their way of thinking. Is that something that would be? Well, again, you can only find it from within. So you, you really can't change somebody's way of thinking, oh my God, it would be so great if you could. Because if I could change the way people think, everybody would think like me. Yeah. But, but you don't do that. What you, what you do is you don't change their way of thinking. You show them something new and they change from within. And I bet I could tell this story. Go for it. I think I shared this with you the day we talked. I think you may have. And um, it's, this is really a special um, something to share. And you talk about warm fuzzies or, or things that... Um, I think we all need to not only be in our own thoughts, but also be sensitive and compassionate and perceptive of other people's feelings and their need to help guide their thoughts. Or, um, and some of you have heard the story, but um, I read the Celestine Prophecy. And from that book, I, I gained a lot of insight into people and um, messages that, that were given to me. And this was a particular time that we, came up to New Hampshire. We lived in Connecticut and um, came up to New Hampshire to look at a cottage for summer vacation with our children. And um, the people we were renting from were on Bellow Lake. And um, I met the husband and, and the wife. <sighs> she was just so distraught and just, you know, and I had never met her before. And I thought, gosh, she just isn't real happy. But that's not for me, you know. We just wanted to rent the house. We're not worried about it. So we started talking and walking, and she said, how many children do you have? And I said, well, we have four children. And she said, oh, we have four children as well. And the more we walked and the more we talked, um, she got to know me a little bit better within minutes, I guess, because we were walking along, and she said, Jenny, she said, I feel comfortable that I can tell you this, but we really have five children. And I said, oh, 
She said, um, our oldest child committed suicide. But I don't tell anybody this, and please don't tell anybody on the lake this, because I don't want anybody to know. So she's holding all these feelings inside of herself. And I said, Pat, I said, I just finished reading the most wonderful book, and I'm hoping by you reading this that perhaps you can change some of your feelings and maybe bring some happiness to your life. So we went home, came back that summer, and she ran up to the car, Jenny, Jenny, I have to talk to you. And I said, oh, Pat, different person. I said, what happened? She said, well, I was sitting down on the beach on a chair, and there was this fly, butterfly, bug or something. And she said, usually I'm just down the beach, I'm slapping everything away. And she, that's just like, a, uh, uh, uh. she said, you know, I, I didn't do it that time. I don't know why I didn't. But she said, then I walked up to the house to get a bottle of water. And I went in the house and got the water. And I came back outside. And sitting on the railing of that porch outside was the butterfly that she almost killed down on the beach. And it dawned on her that this was the day, that this was her son's birthday. And she couldn't thank me enough because she said this was the first communication she had had with her son since he had died. And she was just so overwhelmed and appreciative. And she said, Jenny, you've, you've changed my life. You've changed the perspective that I have on looking at things. And um, so that's just how sometimes it's not just how we deal with our own thoughts, but I think many times we can help other people in, in a crisis work through some of the things that they need to work through. And it's a story I'll never forget because it changed my life as well. What I love about that story is it points to a raising of consciousness. You hear people say all the time, you raise your consciousness. I remember hearing that once upon a time, thought that was a hippy dippy thing to hear and raise your consciousness, expand your mind. I don't know what that means. What it means is you gain a deeper understanding of life. A raising consciousness is just a different, deeper understanding of life. It's kind of like being uh, on the outside of a high rise building and you're in a glass elevator. Right. A lot of people live in the basement and they don't even know they're in an elevator. All they see is the basement level. That's all they can see, especially when they're caught up in their pain. And to Ginny's point, what she did was she showed the woman, this is an elevator, there's the button, you can go up. And when you go up, you see more. And when you see more, your life becomes richer. That's a raise of consciousness. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a deepening of our understanding of how life works which is why I wanted to bring this to you today, because understanding how we work psychologically just helps us see more and deeper and better into ourselves and other people. It's quarter to 11, where are we time-wise? How long, how long are we here? <laughs> we're here to 11, okay. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Like, I don't know how long we're here for. Does anybody else have anything to share? Or something you don't understand? No? Okay. That's cool. What I would invite you to do is just kind of let all of this settle and just start to kind of notice it within yourself and start to notice those moments when you're really caught up in your thinking. And notice that that is simply, it's not a bad thing. We get very upset about, I have anxiety, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling my grief or whatever. And we think that those feelings have meaning. We try to make meaning of those feelings. If you look at feelings as simply the GPS letting you know what's happening in your mind, the quality of your mind, the quality of your thinking is just not great. It takes the fear out of emotions. It takes the meaning out of the emotions. And one of the things Sydney Banks said, if the one thing that people could do is not be afraid of their experience, that alone would change the world. We're very afraid of our experience and we don't recognize 
that we are made in God's image as creators. We are the creators. We are the thinkers. We are creating our experience every minute of our day. So I don't know what happens next, but <laughs> thank you very much. We give you all that we are and everything you have entrusted to us. Come bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory. Amen. Okay, so I get to do the last part here, the benediction. And what I'm going to leave you with is just some thoughts to reflect on. 
One of them is keep it simple. As Sidney Banks said, if it's complicated, it's the intellect. If it's simple, it's the spirit. Look within. Always look within for the answers. You have your answers always. Just settle your mind, put the snow globe down, and as Evie pointed out, it will come to you. Find a beautiful feeling. This is what we're looking for, folks. When I talk about mental health and well-being, I'm talking about that beautiful feeling. When we're here in the moment with each other and we're in that beautiful feeling, we are not suffering. We can't. It's not possible. You're in the feeling. Find the feeling. And when you find the feeling, give it away. And when you give it away, give it to yourself first. Because if it's within you, you can share it with the world. Thank you. <laughs>